Biovivacious. I am Sebastian. Biovivacious is a YouTube channel dedicated to clear fundamentals of biosciences and make the subject exciting. Let us begin a discussion of metabolism by taking carbohydrate as an example. So the simplest pathway to begin understanding metabolism is glycolysis. So as the name suggests, glycolysis is breaking of glucose, that is glycolysis. For several reasons, it's very appropriate that we begin our study of metabolism by studying glycolysis because um, you know this is one of the earliest pathway that we have understood in detail maybe from the beginning of 1900s till it took shape in 1940 so this is one of the pathway that has been studied elaborately by very many scientists and secondly this is a pathway that is nearly universal in all living things you take bacteria to the advanced any advanced cell this pathway is universal and uh, if the regulatory mechanisms of this pathway is very well understood so therefore it will give us a clue about understanding regulatory mechanisms and finally this pathway has played a very central role in metabolism because it provides several intermediates and energy molecules. Remember, this pathway is as old as 3.5 billion years. So, in many ways, therefore, this is a pathway that we should begin our discussion on metabolism. So, look at glucose molecule. Glucose is a wonder molecule because glucose is an excellent fuel molecule. Oxidized glucose anaerobically to carbon dioxide and water, it will yield roughly about 2840 kilojoules of energy per mole. That's a huge amount of energy. So, and it provides energy in the form of ATP. And ATP is the best form for conversion of energy, transfer of energy in living system. Glucose also has got uh, um, another big advantage. That advantage is you can store glucose as a very high molecular weight polymer. Soon we will be looking at the degradation of glycogen in another video. So therefore the point is it can be stored as a high molecular weight polymer and this can be stored without affecting or with the minimum effect on the osmolality of the cell or blood and additionally as i mentioned a little while ago that is it is a precursor for several biosynthetic reactions you will see the intermediates that are formed from glycolysis becoming the starting material for synthesizing many many useful molecule in living system so let us begin this journey of understanding glycolysis now let us look at the fate of glucose molecule in higher plants and animals glucose has got three major fates as you can see from the figure so one possibility is glucose can be broken down to uh, pyruvate two molecules of pyruvate it can be oxidized that is a process known as glycolysis remember uh, rbc uh, renal medulla uh, brain sperm etc has glucose as the the only source or the major source of metabolic energy another fate of glucose is it can be oxidized through a pathway known as pentose phosphate pathway we will be elaborating on PPP later on in another video. If the third possible fate of glucose once it is absorbed is it can be converted to a polysaccharide like uh, it can be converted to uh, starch or it can be converted to 
glycogen and stored for future use. So these are the three major fates of glucose once it is absorbed. Before we get into understanding glycolysis, let me give you an overall picture of glycolysis. See, there are about 10 steps in glycolysis in the conversion of glucose to pyruvate. And these 10 steps are divided into the first five steps are considered to be the preparatory steps. That is, the glucose molecule is going to be prepared to give away, to release lots of energy. In the last five steps are called the payoff steps, which means energy which is present in the carbon-carbon linkages are transferred or transferred into ATP molecules. That is called the payoff steps. If you look at all the 10 steps of glycolysis, you will realize there are five different kinds of reactions occurring in glycolysis. You will find a phosphate group is transferred in certain reactions. You will find a phosphate group is shifted from one position to the next position. You will find isomerization reaction happening. You will find dehydration, molecule of water is removed. You will also find aldol cleavage, carbon, carbon is broken. So such five kinds of reactions are seen in glycolysis. So therefore, there are 10 enzymes taking part in glycolysis. And all 10 enzymes are examples of alpha, beta proteins. So alpha, beta protein is a kind of a protein configuration, protein arrangement, protein architecture. You will be learning more about alpha, beta architecture later on in another video. All these enzymes are present in the cytoplasm. So therefore, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of a cell. Um, look at the intermediates. The intermediates of glycolysis are either six carbon compounds like glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, etc. or three carbon compounds like dihydroxyacetone phosphate or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. So therefore, all the six carbon units are derivatives of glucose and fructose. All the three carbon units are derivatives of dihydroxyacetone phosphate or glyceraldehyde or pyruvate. So this is the basic background before we get into understand glycolysis. At this point, it's very important that we look at the historical background of the elucidation of this particular pathway. Let us look at some of the crucial experiments which were carried out in early years. So the first person is Louis Pasteur in 1856. What Louis Pasteur demonstrated was that uh, fermentation can be carried out by microorganisms outside a living cell. This was a, a, a crucial development. Then what happens is by accidentally uh, Hans Buchner and Edward Buchner uh, made another discovery about yeast extract. So in those days yeast extract was preserved in uh, in an antiseptic, though they were using phenol as an antiseptic or sucrose as an antiseptic. One day they decided to preserve yeast extract in sucrose. The next day they found that it got fermented and alcohol is pro produced after some days. So this was a very chance discovery that yeast is a ca capable of, of carrying out fermentation of sugar. Then another discovery comes in 1905 by Arthur Harden and William Young. So they found what they did was they added inorganic phosphate into uh, this yeast extract with the sugar. So then they realized that the fermentation got stimulated and fermentation got prolonged. And they also observed that the inorganic phosphate is disappearing from the medium. So therefore they postulated that sugar phosphate esters are formed and they tried to find these sugar phosphate esters. 
you see this pathway is being developed step by step it is developed step by step not all of a sudden it is the painful experimentation of several people over a long period of time a major breakthrough comes in 1930s and 1940s by many scientists and the three of them you will see the image there one is emden meyerhof and parnas there were many more other scientists who contributed to it like newber um, cory and cory so all of them contributed towards the elucidation of this pathway but these three people emden meyerhof and parnas made the maximum contribution so therefore glycolysis is also known as EMP pathway in honor of these three scientists so this is the pathway that we are going to study a very old discovered pathway and a crucial pathway that is uh, shared in all living beings with this background let us see what kind of a strategy was devised by these organisms over a period of 3.5 billion years in order to harvest energy through glycolysis from carbohydrate so the strategy lies in first of all to trap the substrate molecules inside the cell so once it is inside it should not get out then phosphorylate these intermediates okay so once it is phosphorylated uh, make you know low phosphate group transfer potential molecule so that it can be circulated third is convert chemically these low phosphate group transfer potential molecules into convert them into a high phosphate group transfer potential molecule and finally couple these reactions couple energy yielding hydrolysis into converting adp into atp so therefore so therefore what we can do is energy poor molecules have been converted or coupled into energy rich molecule like atp so that is the logic or strategy adopted by glycolysis so therefore glycolysis has got uh, three stages in the first stage is what we call it a priming stage so in priming stage two priming reactions occurs and we are converting we are trapping the molecule inside making it a energy relatively energy rich molecule in the second stage is called a splitting state so in splitting stage we will convert the six carbon compound into two three carbon compounds in the third is the oxido reduction and the phosphorylation stage so therefore this low phosphate transfer potential molecules we are converting them into high trans phosphate transfer potential molecules and we are going to harvest the energy and energy will be harvested in the form of atp molecules so these are the three stages of uh, uh, glycolysis when we deal with the uh, regulation of glycolysis we will also talk about uh, the flux in the number of molecules in each of these pools in each of these three pools are very very important in regulating metabolic pathways especially glycolysis so far we have looked at three important aspects of glycolysis number 1 why we should study this pathway as the first pathway in our understanding of metabolism second in the historical development that has happened in the case of glycolysis and third what is the strategy followed in glycolysis so now let us move on we take up the first reaction that is in the preparatory stage in the first reaction is converting glucose molecule to its phosphorylated form that is glucose 6 phosphate what is important for us to notice is phosphorylation occurs at the sixth position of glucose so this is also called in the first priming step remember this is not a committing step of glycolysis 
I request that all of you go back to those classes where we dealt with the regulation of metabolic pathways. So therefore, this is not a committing step. Also look at the amount of free energy change that has occurred. It is about minus 16.7 kilojoules per mole. It is like, you know, like pushing a, a stone to a mountain top. So therefore, mountain top and then we have released the stone. So the stone has come down. So it cannot be reversed. So it is an irreversible step. The enzyme which is catalyzing this reaction is called hexokinase. From the name, you should know that hexo means this enzyme is multi-specific. It has got broad specificity. It can phosphorylate any hexoses. It can phosphorylate mannose, phosphorylate fructose, galactose. All this can be phosphorylated by hexokinase. So this enzyme has got a very low Vmax. So Vmax is a concept that you will be learning in detail as part of enzymology. So it is about the maximum efficiency of an enzyme. So we know that uh, from uh, our understanding that uh, half of Vmax is what we call it a Km value. So Km is that concentration of the substrate which is needed to half saturate the enzyme. That is called the Km value. So we also know that smaller the Km, it has got very high affinity for the substrate. So, since the Vmax of this enzyme is low and the Km is also small, it means that the enzyme gets saturated in very low concentration of, sub of substrate molecule. So, whenever if glucose is present in very low concentration, the enzyme is always remain saturated. So, that is the point that we need to understand from this. And also remember, this enzyme is following something called an induced fit concept. In another video, we will be learning about which are these theories, induced fit, etc. So therefore, this enzyme is following an induced fit concept. The real substrate for this enzyme is the magnesium, which is blocking the charge of an ATP molecule. It will shield two positive uh, negative charges of an ATP molecule. So it forms a complex and it is the real substrate of this enzyme. Um, this is so a regulated enzyme. That is an important point that we need to remember. It is a regulated enzyme. And it's, therefore it is an allosteric enzyme. What can regulate this enzyme? One of them is ADP molecules. ADP showing that the energy level is low can activate the enzyme so that more ATP will be produced in glycolysis. Similarly, glucose 6-phosphate, that is the end product, feedbackly it can inhibit hexokinase. So this we will be dealing with the regulation of this enzyme elaborately later on. So these are the points that you need to remember with regard to hexokinase reaction. Hexokinase is an isoenzyme. Isoenzyme, you know that they are different forms of enzyme. So they will catalyze similar reaction, but they are different forms of enzymes. So this isoenzyme form of hexokinase is called glucokinase, which is very much present in liver. One of the difference of glucokinase from hexokinase is that the Km value. The Km of glucokinase is uh, 10 raised to the power minus 2 molar. So look at the graph here. If the red line is indicating hexokinase, so the Km is about, Km is the half saturation, so it is about 0 0.4 millimolar. Whereas you see in the, in the, in the half line, so this will be the Km of hexokinase, uh, glucokinase. This will be the Km. So which is very, very high. It's about a thousand times more than in the Km value of hexokinase. What does it actually indicates? It indicates that glucokinase requires a very much higher glucose concentration for half saturation. So this gives a lot of advantage for an organism. For example, it allows uh, the liver to remove glucose or liver to absorb glucose from the 
portal blood sap portal blood so they found immediately after a meal in the post absorptive period there will not be any sudden hyperglycemic effect glucose will not be there too much in blood so this can be because the enzyme is not getting saturated it can accept it can convert large quantity of glucose into glucose 6 phosphate so this is one of the difference between hexokinase and glucokinase which is an iso enzyme form of hexokinase if you look at glycolysis holistically you will see that nine intermediates of glycolysis are phosphorylated so there has to be some logic for phosphorylating these intermediates let us try to understand this so in the most important aspect is see in the phosphate groups which are attached to these intermediates they are ionized at a ph of 7 so which is you understand the blood ph is Uh, let's say 7.36 to 7.4 so all these molecules will remain in an ionized form and you should also immediately understand that um, plasma membrane is impermeable to charged molecules so in glycolysis initially therefore invest a certain amount of energy and then these molecules are not allowed to come out that means no further investment has to be done in order to retain these molecules within the cell that is an excellent point the second aspect is uh, this is one way by which metabolic energy can be conserved through enzymatic reactions so therefore by converting one phosphorylated intermediate into the next one energy can be conserved in living system so therefore this is a second reason in the third reason for phosphorylated uh, intermediate is uh, by binding of phosphate groups to the active site of the enzyme it will bring down minimize the e act e act is the activation energy for a reaction to occur so it can be brought down it can be minimized in the fourth point is uh, see as soon remember that glucose comes it is absorbed inside a cell once it is inside immediately it is converted to glucose 6 phosphate so when you compare the concentration of glucose inside the cell and outside the cell there is a huge difference outside is highly concentrated and inside is it's not there because it is going to be converted to glucose or it is minimum because it is going to be converted to glucose 6 phosphate so if the intracellular concentration of glucose is maintained very very low and this will favor in the diffusion of glucose from outside to the cell and finally remember regulations are very very effective when a metabolic pathway is not at equilibrium so these are some of the points that we need to keep in mind in order to understand why there are so many phosphorylated intermediates in glycolytic pathway in the second reaction in glycolysis is an isomerization reaction of glucose 6 phosphate the enzyme is phosphoglucoisomerase it will convert glucose to glucose 6 phosphate to fructose 6 phosphate now remember both these molecules are ring structures okay so therefore in order to convert glucose to fructose that is an aldose to a ketose the ring has to be open and remember in glucose carbon number 1 is an aldehyde and this has to be isomerized to a keto group on carbon number 2 then only the ring closure has to occur so this is the aldose to ketose conversion which is catalyzed by the isomerase enzyme so this reaction is thermodynamically not favorable because if the 
uh, it has a positive delta g that is about positive plus 1.67 kilojoules per mole um still it is a readily reversible reaction and we will see why it is reversible maybe at the end of the entire glycolysis we will look at it how it can be made a reversible reaction what all factors help in making it a reversible reaction and remember it is not a rate limiting step or it is not a regulated step so a question that you need to ask at the moment is why cell should invest so much of energy in synthesizing an enzyme to convert an aldose into a ketose this is the question that you need to answer ask and you will should find an answer by end of this session now we come to another very important step in glycolysis that is reaction number three so reaction number three is the phosphorylation of fructose six phosphate into fructose one six bisphosphate catalyzed by an enzyme known as phosphofructokinase number one with a huge negative delta g of minus 14.2 kilojoules per mole remember this is a second priming reaction and it is also an irreversible step and it is the committing step of glycolysis so which is the most important control point of glycolysis is this reaction catalyzed by pfk number one if the product is fructose 1 6 bisphosphate so we use the term bis to denote that if the two phosphate groups are separate they are not together compare this with the adp adp is diphosphate which means both the phosphate groups are together here if the two phosphate groups are separate remember this and this enzyme is highly specific for the d isomer of fructose 6 phosphate so it is an allosteric enzyme it is an inducible enzyme so several allosteric molecules can change its activity for example adp amp which are showing that the energy level is very low it can stimulate the enzyme pfk so atp nadh citrate that will show that the enzyme is uh, sorry the the cell is rich in energy it will activate the enzyme so this is something that we need to keep in mind in this particular reaction and also remember that some bacteria plants they have uh, uh, they can use pyrophosphate okay pyrophosphate that is ppi to phosphorylate in the substrate molecule not necessarily atp is required this is another variation in the previous section i have raised a question the question was uh, why this glucose 6 phosphate should be converted to fructose 6 phosphate why can't we phosphorylate glucose 6 phosphate into glucose 1 6 bisphosphate rather than having an intermediary step i want you to keep thinking about it maybe at the end of it you should be able to come up with the answer another important reaction in glycolysis is reaction number four where cleavage of a six carbon compound that is fructose one six bisphosphate will occur with the help of enzyme known as aldolase the two products that will be formed is one is dihydroxyacetone phosphate and the other one is glyceraldehyde three phosphate one is a ketose other one is an aldose the names aldolase comes from the fact that two small either one aldose and a ketose join together to form a large ketose that's why the name aldolase comes so aldolase is a highly uh, stereospecific enzyme and this is the only reaction in glycolysis where a carbon carbon bond is broken now you will find two kinds of aldolases in living system one is aldolase 1 class 1 aldolase which is occurring in higher organisms whereas aldolase 2 which is a more primitive enzyme which is found in fungi algae and bacteria and which is dependent on zinc for its activity 
what is important for us at the moment is to pay attention to the carbon numbers in fructose so look at the way carbons are numbered 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 and pay attention to where exactly aldolase is cleaving it is cleaving the carbon carbon bond between 3 and 4 and producing the two intermediates so therefore you pay attention to this was originally carbon number 1 carbon number 2 carbon number 3 in fructose 1 6 bisphosphate this is number 4 5 and 6 in the original fructose 1 6 bisphosphate what happens is with this cleavage you will see a lot of similarity between carbon number 6 and carbon number 1 now you know that in from the next step onwards only glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is able to continue with the glycolysis therefore dihydroxyacetone will be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate in reaction number 5 so therefore you need to pay attention to what happens to the carbon numbering because this becomes a point for us to discuss suppose we number carbon number 1 by using radio labeling let's say c13 is used to um, label c this particular carbon atom where will it appear see immediately you can see that this is coming here or uh, this is coming here so therefore 1 and 6 from the old number 1 and 6 is going to be carbon number 3 in the new structure 2 and 5 will become carbon number 2 in the new structure of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate carbon number 3 and 4 will become carbon number 1 so therefore the radio labeled carbon number 1 will be this carbon atom that is carbon number 6 so this point you keep tracking now for the rest of the pathway now we come to the last stage in the preparatory phase of glycolysis that is the isomerization of dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate the enzyme is triose phosphate isomerase in the direct substrate for glycolysis is glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so therefore all the dhap must be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so remember at equilibrium about 96 percentage will be dihydroxyacetone phosphate so depending on, on the need as glyceraldehyde is moving into the third flux of glycolysis lot more of dhap will be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and glycolysis will continue so therefore at the end of this what are we trying to conclude so we have seen that one molecule of glucose is converted to two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate no energy has been extracted so far and we have invested two atp molecules in order to prime the reactions so this is the summary till reaction number five and i have also raised two fundamental questions one question is why glucose 6-phosphate should be phosphorylated again or why can't we cleave glucose 6-phosphate directly into two three carbon products we need to find answer to that and the second important aspect that you need to pay attention is in the numbering of the carbon atoms remember in the numbering of the carbon atoms i have shown the numbering that is done in the case of fructose 1 6 bisphosphate and in the numbering of carbon atoms in dhap as well as in glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate so this becomes important for us if we have to radio label one of the carbon atoms let us say carbon number one of glucose is radio labeled where will it appear in the structure of pyruvate so in order to follow this we need to now constantly monitor the carbon atoms so remember now it is like we have divided the six carbon into after the third carbon we have made a cut and it is like 
folding the paper back into itself which means carbon number 1 and 6 become same 2 and 5 becomes the same and 3 and 4 becomes the same so therefore it is important for us to monitor if your carbon number 1 is radio label where will it appear in carbon in the in the structure of pyruvate so keep monitoring it is going to be very exciting for you to monitor the location of the radio labeled carbon atom i hope you have enjoyed this video and this journey of understanding glycolysis we will continue with the remaining portion of the glycolysis in the next video